No matter what situation you face, no matter what your challenges are, now or any time in the future, the Word is your answer. And I say that as emphatically as I can. Let me start off by, by, by setting a quick groundwork here. Um, first of all, God's plan for you and I is total success and victory all the time. If you were to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28, to 28, and you were to read it in the message translation, um, part of what it says, it, when, when, it, when it speaks about, about replenishing the earth and so on, it says to prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, and take charge. When God created man, God's plan was for you and I to prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, and to take charge. And that very essence of, of that, the dominion, uh, multiply, that, that in itself is a reflection of God's very own nature. When the Bible speaks in, in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 18, and it talks about Jesus delivering us out, 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 out of the penalty from sin, or in another translation, delivering us out of trouble. He didn't just deliver us out of trouble, out of that mess and that darkness that we were in underneath the devil's dominion, but he also brought us into life, say life. And that's important. He brought us into life, which is the life of God. Zoe, life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, and here we go again, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God reveals them unto us by his spirit. And by the way, his word is spirit and life. God reveals them unto us by his word and by his spirit. What does he reveal to us? These things that he's prepared for them that love him. God has got things that we have not even imagined of. And God, God, God has a good plan for our lives. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 that God says, I've got a good plan. I've got a good future for you. I've got a plan of peace and wholeness and prosperity and victory. Nothing broken, nothing missing. My thoughts concerning you, uh, um, the thoughts I have concerning you is just about your well-being. Amen? God is concerned and, and has a plan for you to be well. Amen? For you to be well, for you to be whole, for you to be prosperous. Um, let me flip to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 and read it from the Amplified. The King James says, oh, we are his workmanship. The Amplified says that you are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those things, those good works which God predestined planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that you and I should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. God has got a good life that he prearranged and made available and ready for you and I to live. When you and I got born again, what we did is we just, be, we just entered in through the door to enter into that good life that he has for us. Amen? Now, what we do have to do is find the pathways that he has prepared for us individually and walk down those pathways. But my point here is that God has got a good life for you, a life of prosperity, a life of victory, a life of wholeness, where no weapon formed against you will prosper because your righteousness is of him. And we can talk much about that, but I do need to move on. However, um, here is the thing, and we've got to understand this about God, and we must understand this about the kingdom of God. God is a faith God. The way you operate in the kingdom of God is by faith, which means what? You must believe. Say, I must believe. Romans chapter 4 verse 16 says, um, It is of faith that it might be according to God's grace, that is his, um, his, his um, unmerited favor, his empowerment, his ability, and so on and so forth, his anointing. It is of faith that it might be by grace, so that the promise and the promises might be available to all the seed, to each and every one of us. But how is it available to all of us? By faith. Which means what? That if we do not believe, we do not have access to that grace. 
We do not have access to that sufficiency. We do not have access to that empowerment, to that enablement, to that provision. If we don't believe, we do not have access. Amen? The grace of God makes the abundance of God and the sufficiency of God available to us, but we access this grace by faith, by believing. So much so that Jesus said to Martha, after Lazarus has been dead for, for several days, and, 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 um, and she was talking to Jesus about it, that if you had been there, my brother would not have died, and so on. And Jesus says, only believe. If you believe, you will see what? If you believe, you will see what? The glory of God, which is the, the manifested goodness of God. If you believe, you will see the goodness of God. If you believe, you will see God's excellence. You will see God's provisions. You will see God's empowerment. Amen? If you believe. I'm saying this, I want to emphasize that you must believe. Without believing, you can't access this grace. So even though God has this wonderful plan for our lives and wonderful provisions, without faith, we can't access it. And then what happens is that we can stumble along the Christian life and just hope to make it through the end. And, 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 and that's not what the plan is. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. He's given us all things richly to enjoy. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Just like you get very happy when you see your kids are rejoicing, when you see your kids happy, when you see your kids blessed, it gives you joy, doesn't it? Amen? All right. Now, not only does God desire for us to have this awesome life, oh, let's call it a heavenly life. Quite frankly, because the Bible calls, the Bible says we are citizens of heaven. The Bible says in, in another place, in, in Deuteronomy, it says how oh, if we would follow these words, if we would let these words be like front lid before our eyes and bind them up, up on our hands and stay with the word and, and, and so on and so forth. It says we can have days of heaven and earth, which means live on earth, but like if you're living in heaven. Amen. And in the midst of all your enemies, having God prepare a table before you. In the presence of your enemies. Enemies are there, but here you are, having a good time with God. Amen? Tests and trials come, but in all these things, you're more than conquerors. You can be of good cheer. All right. Not only does God desire this heavenly life for us, but hear this now. God has equipped us. God has equipped, has given us, has equipped us so that we can have this heavenly life and that this heavenly life will become a real, a reality. Let's put it that way. He has equipped us. Now, I want to spend a few minutes on that. Now, I'm going to say this right up front. The number one way that God has equipped us is that he's given us grace. Say grace. Now, grace is not just, okay, let me put it this way. You know the Bible says that if we abide in Christ, we ought to walk as he did. We ought to walk like Jesus. All right? <laughs> I'll put it this way. God wants you to walk as Jesus. Grace is not only we are saved by grace through faith, the forgiveness of sins. Thank God for that. Unmerited favor. Thank God for that. The grace of God is the sufficiency and the empowerment and the enablement of God to live the Christian life. Are you with me? Now, if the grace is the empowerment and the ability and the anointing and the sufficiency of God to live the Christian life, and God says you are to walk even as Jesus walked, then grace has got to be the ability to live like Jesus. I never said that before. That's an original thought. Glory to God. Every once in a, once in a while I get one of those. <laughs> Amen. But really, it is the ability of God, whoo, hallelujah, to live like Jesus. Say to live like Jesus. To walk as he walked. So grace gives you the power to live like Jesus, which means it gives you the ability and the power to continually receive the benefits of salvation. Amen? All right. It gives you the ability to receive the benefits of salvation. It gives you the ability and the power to go beyond your own natural ability. For that reason, it says, if we go back into um, Zechariah, 
How can this mountain before Zechariah be removed? It is done by grace, it says. Not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit. One verse says, by the Spirit, and the verse before it says, it's done by grace. Which is the same thing, because the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of grace. How shall this mountain be removed? Not by my ability, not by my power. But it is done by grace. So grace is the ability of God for me to go beyond my ability and to receive the benefits of my salvation. So I'm talking about grace, not just the forgiveness that gets you started, but I'm talking about the grace to live. Now, we will deal with this message in its fullness, if that's possible, because I don't even know that. <laughs> so we'll see. But we're going to deal with this to a greater degree sometime in the future. Now, turn with me to John chapter 1. All right. The ability to live like Jesus. Say grace. The power to go beyond. Woo, hallelujah. <laughs> the power to go beyond. I like that. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here is Jesus, Jesus, full of grace and truth. Jesus, full of grace and truth. So somehow, it's as if grace is Christ. Grace is, Jesus is full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace. See, if you're going to be, so when you have Christ, you have grace. Let's read on. Verse 16. And of his fullness have all we received grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Here is my point. In order to live this life, you need grace. Now here I want to say to you, not only were you saved by grace, but God has given you grace because God has given you Christ. Is Christ in you? Well, he is full of grace. When he came in, he didn't leave any of himself out. When God you give you Jesus, he freely give you all things. Now, you got to believe the word here, okay? When God gave you Jesus, he freely gave you, past tense, all things. And when he gave you Jesus, when Jesus came, Jesus came and all the fullness of the God there dwells in him. And he came in there with all of his fullness. He is full of grace. So he is in there with all that full grace. Because he gave you all things, no wonder... It says you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing means there is none left out. So, in order for me to live this life, God has given me grace. He's given me Christ. He's given me grace. Grace, the empowerment to receive and to pull out from all of these spiritual blessings, to receive all that salvation has provided, all the benefits of salvation, grace, the ability to go beyond my ability and live this life, and to live like Jesus did. So it says in John 1, 16, Of his fullness have all we received. Grace for grace. Of his fullness. Of his fullness. Of the completeness of Jesus. You have received the completeness of Jesus. Now, the fullness of Jesus, the completeness of Jesus, which means what? You have the full nature of Jesus Christ himself in you the moment you got born again. And right now, you have the full nature of Christ. Say, I have the full nature of Christ. Say it again. Say, emphasize every word. I have the full nature of Christ in me now say it again I have the full nature of Christ in me now 
of his fullness we have received grace for grace. Now in 2 Peter chapter 1, again if we read King James it will tell us, you know, um, how God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him and that we might be partakers of his divine nature and that's good. It is great actually. But let me just read it in a different version here. It says we have everything that we need to live a life that pleases God. It was all given to us by God's own power, by his grace. And God made great and marvelous promises so that his nature would become part of us. All right. His nature, his divine nature. Now what's nature? Nature is defined as the innate essential qualities or character of a person. God's, God has God's divine nature. His divine nature is his divine nature because of his attributes, because of his essential qualities and character. So if you've got God's divine nature, then you've got, it's the character of a person. Then it would mean then that that's, that that's what you got. These characters, these essential innate qualities. Hold that thought. First Peter, that's why again, he will waken our ears to hear. You need to hear as I learn today. Amen. So stay locked in. First Peter 1 22, 23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Is that right? All right. Now let's talk about a seed for a moment. When you see a little seed, that seed has the innate quality of its parent plant. Wouldn't it, would it not? Wouldn't that seed have all the, in it, all the qualities of its parent plant? So when you were born again of this incorruptible seed of the word of God, you have all the nature of your parent. God. Divine nature. The word made flesh. The word that is alive and powerful. Jesus was the word. So the seed planted in us, when we are born again, Listen to me, I, I, I wrote some this out and I'm sticking to it unless the Lord directs me differently. When you were born again and you were born again of that incorruptible seed of the word of God, what does it mean? When you were born again, all that it takes to make Christ who he is was in that seed. No wonder God expects you and I to be conformed to him, to Christ. Because everything that is in Christ was in that seed that you are born of and you have his divine nature, you have his characteristics in it inside of you. No wonder 1 John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we in this world. Now we are daring to believe this. Say, I believe this. Because don't forget, if you don't believe this, you can't access this grace. But when we believe this, then grace will be released for us to live it. And don't forget in the final analysis where this is going to is that every answer to any problem, oh, it is in Christ. It is in all of these spiritual blessings. It is in the word. And it is a matter of how do we get it manifested. Obviously, faith is going to be part of it. Obviously, belief is going to be part of it. But I want us to see, first of all, that the grace to be to live like Christ and to live like Christ, man, you are blessed. <laughs> you are blessed. Amen? To live like Christ, you have authority over devils and demons and sickness and disease and poverty and lack and insufficiency and confusion and oppression and depression and anxiety and fear. <laughs> All right. So the point I'm making here is that we have the comprehensiveness of his nature. No wonder the Bible says, Ye are of God, little children. And as many as receive him, to them give ye power to become the sons of God. Behold what man of love the Father has for you, that you might be called the son of God. You are crucified with Christ. It's no longer you to live, but it is Christ that liveth in you. And the life that you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God. 
You are dead and your life is hid with Christ with God. Uh, is hid with, uh, your, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3, 3. And then verse 4. When Christ who is your life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. I am trying to make this point. The comprehensive, the essence of the life of Christ, his divine nature is in you in all of its fullness. Now you see, you're going to need to know this so that later on, you could, you, could, you could operate in the patience, which is remaining steadfast, remaining consistent, so that that word can be mixed with patience and that promise could come to pass. You're going to need to know that you have that patience. You're going to need to know that you have that joy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Like, you know, I, 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 I've had a couple of very interesting things happening, and I've, I've, I just, I, I just comes occasionally. I, after, after this issue of breaking my leg, I found something really interesting happen. All of a sudden, I had this, I had this spirit of thankfulness in me that, that I was thinking, I mean, that it almost seems like it was ridiculous or phony. It was, so, it was so abundant. And I thought, what is this? And I realized, man, I got this awesome spirit of thankfulness in me. And then, I was telling you last week, coming to church, all of a sudden I realized, I have this peace that is, Beyond normal. And then today, I, I heard, this is what I heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> my wife said to me, Alicia said to her, well, well, what's the matter with daddy? I, I can't remember the exact words. What's the matter with daddy? He what? He seems so happy. Well, what happened with him? I, I, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not miserable. <laughs> Like, what happened with him? What, what, he seemed so very happy. And I thought, oh, is that right? And, you know, and I realized, what's happening here? It is what it is. It is, it is the joy of the Lord. It has nothing to do with circumstances. And I thought, well, maybe God is just having me manifesting some of this stuff. But here's my point. My point is, you have the joy of the Lord inside of you. You have the peace of God which passes all understanding. You have patience that if you would learn to release it and let it, ha let it have its perfect work, you would be entire, wanting nothing. You have got kindness. You have got, you have got the fruits of the Spirit inside of you. You have got, you are your spirit man is holy even as God is holy. Amen? You've got God's divine nature. And if we would believe it and let it begin to change our thinking so that our minds and our attitude is renewed to that truth, we would walk after the new man. And certain things would be automatic. And this is where God wants us to be. This is how we are going to come into this place. It is by that grace that will teach us to live godly and soberly in this present generation. Not laws and rules and regulations. It's yielding to that grace, which is the very life of Christ that is in you. Amen. All right? So how can we get us this grace? How can we get this, this stuff in here to be manifested? Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. How do we get the results? How do we get the manifestation? Acts chapter 20. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able, it is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. He says, I commit you to the word of his grace. And this word is able to build you up. This word is able to cause your inheritance, which is yours, to be given to you. It will can cause your inheritance to be made manifested. The word of God can do that. The word of God can build you up. Now, the word of God can educate your mind and your spirit 
where righteousness is concerned, where your authority is concerned, where the name of Jesus is concerned, where the blood is concerned, where forgiveness is concerned, and, all, and the promises of God and so on. So the Word of God is able to build you up. The Word of God is able to teach you and separate you unto God and all these other things. The Word of God is able to bring you into a place where you could walk in agreement and you could agree with God. All right. But this Word of God is able to give you grace and the Word of God is able to cause your inheritance to become a reality and to be manifested in your life. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55. Now if I were to give, um, if I were to put a, a, a scripture and say this is the text, this would be it. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11. It says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and that word will prosper whereunto I send it. The word will prosper whereunto I send it. The word will succeed whereunto I send it. In other words, the word will prosper in the thing we want to in the it. The word will accomplish its assignment. In other words, then if you've got, if you need healing, then that healing scripture will accomplish its assignment. It will bring forth healing. A prosperity scripture will bring forth prosperity. A peace of mind scripture will bring forth peace of mind. Are you with me? A scripture about the might and the power of God will bring forth might and power in your life. A scripture about being able to do all things through Christ that strengthens you will bring that forth. The word will succeed whereunto it is sent. Now, I'm just going to give you this very quickly. Because that is the case, because the word will has the ability to succeed, for that reason, that's the reason why you have Luke 1, 37, which says, with, and this is regarding Mary, um, how is this going to be? And, 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 and the scripture says, with God all things are possible. Another version says, no word of God is void of power. Another version of, of, of Luke 1, 37 says that the word basically says, no word of God is, is void of power and, 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 and lacks the ability to fulfill itself. The word has the ability to fulfill itself. Jeremiah 1 verse 12. Why is it so that the word of God is going to succeed? Because it has the ability to fulfill itself. Why is the word of God going to prosper in the thing we want to descend? Because Jeremiah 1 12. God says, I am going to watch over my word to perform it. I'm going to watch over my word to make it good and to bring it to pass. Why is, it, why is it that the Word of God will prosper? Because, John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word is, the Word was God. So the Word has the ability to succeed and to prosper whereunto it is sent because it has the ability to bring itself to pass, because God watches over the Word to perform it, and because God and His Word are one. Hebrews 1 verse 3, God opposes all things by the Word of His power. Now, let me give this air as well. You see, the word is spirit and the word is life. John 6, 63. The word is spirit and the word is life. So, whether it be a healing situation or a financial situation, everything in this natural world came from out of the world realm of the spirit. Through faith, we understand the words were framed. So that the things that are seen were not made of the things which do appear. The things that are seen came from the unseen realm. The natural came after the spiritual. So the word is spirit and the word is life. The word has the ability. When you, you see, when you, when you take God's word in your mouth and you begin to speak it, and you begin to speak healing, you are releasing that healing. You are releasing that life, that spirit and that life, that Zoe life of God into your body or into the situation. The Word of God is creative, which means if something doesn't exist, it can create it. You put all of that together, and what you see is the fact that the Word is definitely, beyond all shadow of a doubt, has the ability to prosper in a thing where on to descent. 
Now, where is that going? It would mean then that if I have a problem, all I got to do is to be able to find the word and to get the word to go into my problem as the answer, and my problem will no longer be a problem, but my problem is going to be replaced by the answer. Does that make sense? Amen. Because that is true, therefore, the gospel, the word of God, is therefore the power and the ability of God to produce salvation. Which means to produce wholeness, healing, deliverance, prosperity, preservation, divine protection. The word of God can therefore do all of these things. Amen? The word of God can do anything that God can do. Because God and his word are one. The word therefore, all right. The word will therefore bring healing for the one that is sick. Deliverance to the one that is oppressed. Freedom to the one that is bound. Hope to the one that is discouraged. Peace of mind and soundness to the one who is confused and filled with anxiety. The word, and, and the, the, the word of God can therefore bring prosperity to the one that is in lack and, in, and, 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 and that doesn't have any sufficiency. The word of God has, can do that. Amen? And we could go on and on and on and on. All things are possible to God, so all things are possible to the Word. I'm only trying to convince you of this, that the Word of God is your answer. Amen? And for that reason, Jesus says, A man shall not live by bread alone, but you shall live. And you can have this God kind of life sustained by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, how does it work? Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. How does it work? Okay. So this seed of the word has the ability to bring itself to pass. This seed of the word has God inside of it, has Jesus inside of it, has the divine nature inside of it, and the divine nature is no lack in no area. Amen? Mark chapter 4, how does it work? Well, in the natural, Jesus said the way it works is just like and he, Jesus talked about the power of the sower. You got to get seed into good ground. Seed into what kind of ground? Good ground. Amen? All right. Concerning that good ground, it says in Mark chapter 4 and verse 26, So is the kingdom of God. It is as if a man cast seed into the ground. And he should sleep and he rise night and day. And the, she, the, seed, should, the seed should spring up. He doesn't know how, how it grows and how it springs up. He doesn't know how, but it happens anyway. You don't have to know how, but if you plant the seed... And you, and you deal with the seed correctly, you don't have to understand everything about it. It will still work for you. If you confess that by Jesus' stripes, I am healed, and you don't say nothing else, and that word, and you attend to that word, and you keep that word coming in your ear, and you keep that word as frontless before your eyes, and you get the word into the very midst of the good soil of your heart, and you guard your heart and keep all the weeds and stuff out. And you do not allow your, your mouth to say anything contrary to by his stripes and heal. Healing will show up and it will be health to all your flesh. And the same will apply in any other arena. Amen? Finances or anything else. So it says you go to sleep and you rise day and night. Not knowing and understanding how it works. You don't have to. It's nice to but you don't have to. But the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the air, then the full corn in the air. And when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest has come. This is how it works. Now because this is how it works, what, what has to happen is the seed has to get into the ground and the seed has got to stay in the ground long enough. For the seed to get into the ground, you got to mix the word with faith. The Bible says that if you do not, that the word of God did not profit some of the children of Israel because they didn't mix it with faith. Hebrews 4 verse 2. In other words, whatever that scripture is, you got to believe it. If you don't believe it, then you're not going to see the glory of God. You're not going to see the excellency of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you don't believe it, but you continue to think carnally, the carnal mind cannot please God. Amen? Carnality don't please God. Faith pleases God. Believing and trusting God pleases God. So you must mix the word with faith, which means what? you got to believe it. You got to act on it and you got to think of it and think in line with it as that, that it is so. 
with the same respect that you would give to the word of, of, of a good friend or, 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 or a doctor or, or someone else, you give that respect to the word of God. And you choose to believe it regardless of what it looks like. It must be mixed with faith. But not only must it be mixed with faith, but the Bible says through faith and patience, they obtain the promise. Which means you get a word in the ground, but you got to keep it in the ground. Which means you got to stay consistent. No, I, I don't have time. I, I, I hope to, but I don't have time. But patience is not some, is not some put up with nonsense type attitude. It, it, you, know, you know, it's not some, if patience is remaining consistent. It's remaining firm. It's remaining steady. It is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is remaining the same. That same faith you start with, staying there. Remaining consistent all the time is a secret to success. The Bible says, um, who, whatsoever things he saith, he shall have whatsoever things he saith. Not thing. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith. It is one thing to say a thing when you're praying, but it's another thing to keep saying that after you pray. Amen? Because when you say something different after you pray, you abort in your prayer. It's like going into the ground, taking that good seed, and digging it up. You can't keep doing that and expect a harvest. So the essence of patience is also important. The essence of love goes without saying, faith worked by love. In fact, it says in um, Colossians 3 and verse 14, the love binds everything together in perfect harmony. Everything else is bound together and works because of love. Amen? Your attitude to the word. The Bible says in, in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13, that if you despise the word, then, well, let's put it this way. If you, take, if you despise the word and you think very little of the word and you put very little credit to it, then the word will also despise you, will think very little of you. Now, that's my version. <laughs> Let me give you the King James. The King James says, Whosoever despises the word shall be destroyed. Which one you prefer, mine or the King James? <laughs> right? But he that fear the commandment shall be rewarded. Whoever despises the word and the counsel of God and brings, brings destruction upon himself. All right? <laughs> you are to reverence and respect the word the same way you would God. Having the right attitude towards the word. And of course the word has to be sold in good soil. So you got to take care of the soil of your heart. Anyway, we don't have much time to go, to go forward in that. So let me just begin to wrap this up. The point of the matter is, you've got to get that seed of the word in the ground the same way you would the seed of that tomato planted in the ground and then take care of it until you get a harvest. Add faith, add patience, walk in love. All right, make sure the soil of your heart is okay. Now, here I'm going to give you a prescription, so to speak, that will cause you to have the word of God produced in your life. Would you like to have that? All right, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. Now, it's, all, it, it's, it's very easy in teaching to use healing as an example. But the same thing applies in every other area. Every other area. It applies to the promises for healing, but it applies for the promises for finances or, 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 or your mental health or anything else. Wisdom. Here's the prescription. Now, can you imagine... The medical community, yourselves, if people can get a medicine that would cure every sickness, every disease of any sort, and has no side effects, and this medicine is such that you can take it in massive dose, and you can't overdose on it. And it would prevent, not only heal and prevent illness, but it even has the ability to give you vibrant health so you could walk in divine health where you, don't need, where you wouldn't need divine healing. Did you get that? If you can have this, this medicine that will not only produce all this health, but it will produce prosperity and solve any problem you could ever have in this human existence, would you be interested? <laughs> would you? <laughs> well, here it is. Proverbs chapter 4. If you don't have this on the line in your Bible, please do. Verse 20 to verse 24. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ears unto my saying. 
Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life. Life that includes Zoe. That's the life that God wants you to have. That life includes healing. It includes prosperity. It includes liberty. It includes um, divine protection. All of it. Wisdom. For that it, it is life to those that find them. That find them. Which means it's not automatic that you'll find it. That find them and health to parts of your flesh. No, to all of your flesh. Health to all your flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse it put far from thee. Here is your prescription and the directions and everything else. First, the issue of attending. Attend unto my word. Means what? Give your attention to it. Make it a priority. Now, if you're going to attend to something and make it a priority, it means you might have to set other things that are not as great a priority aside so that you can focus to what you're attending on. Can you imagine a nurse that just leaves her patient? Do you know who's in room 62? Yeah, I know who's in room 62. But knowing him doesn't mean she's attending to him. Amen? Amen? For, here, for her, for that nurse to be attending to that patient, it means that she's going to have to be there constantly, knowing where he's at, and, and there serving him continually. So attend to, to the, attend to the Word of God. It's not good enough to leave your Bible open on that page, that special page, and leave the Bible on the coffee table over there. You're not attending to the Word. Amen? Are you with me? I mean, unless you keep going to that coffee table and reading it. Attend on to my word. Now, we could spend some time amplifying that, but meditate on it. Meditate on what it means to attend to the word. Because if you do that, you're on the way. Incline your ear. Incline your ear. That means put your ear in a position where it can hear the word. Coming to church is good. Listening to tapes is good. But in addition to this... To just putting your ear in position, it means you got to actively become engaged in what you are hearing. You got to believe it. You got to obey it. You got to act on the word. You got to submit and yield to that word. If that word says rejoice always and you have a bad situation, what should you do? If that word says be anxious for nothing and you've got a situation that demands your and you to become anxious and to pull out your hair, what should you do? Be anxious for nothing. If the word says, um, uh, John chapter 14 verse 1 my, uh, um, John 14 verse 1 which is what? Not to be afraid of anything that's, that's, let not your heart be troubled but you've got a real massive demanding situation what should you do? Let not your heart be troubled submit to the word that's all part of inclining your ear to the word in other words making up your mind not only that I'm going to put myself in position to listen to the word, but when I hear it, I'm going to do what it says. Now I'm telling you, here is a, you want to hear, hear a strong word? Get ready. Put your catches out there. Here it is. If you could make up your mind and you could make a covenant between you and God, yes, you can make a covenant with your eyes that your eyes would only look on certain things and not look on other certain things. But if you can, you can make a covenant with your ears. But how about making this covenant before God? Lord, this is your word. This is you talking to me. And your counsel shall stand. This is, this, is, this is exactly where you believe. And, and I need to come in agreement with you. I want to walk with you. It's not about me. It's about honoring you. And I want to honor you by, by living in harmony with your word and with your truth. And Father... I make a commitment to you, even over this communion table, that whatever you show me in this word, I'm going to do it. If you can make a prayer like that and mean it, I'm telling you, success is going to run you down and take you over. Put a note and come back and think on that one. Amen? Amen. In other words, if you can make us, because this is what I'm talking about, inclining your ear onto the word. It also says, and don't let it depart from your eyes. 
Don't let it be far from your eyes. The Bible teaches that when a man, the word of God is like a light, it's like a lamp. And if you keep it before your eyes, and you keep it before your eyes, your whole body will be filled with light. And it will drive all darkness out. It will drive the sickness and disease out. It will drive the poverty and lack out. It will drive the confusion out. And the life of God will be made manifested. When you do those things, it will get into your heart. It will get into your heart. Because you see, ultimately, faith needs to be in your heart and in your mouth. It will get into the midst of your heart. The Bible says, the word of faith is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. With a heart man believes. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Faith needs to be in your mouth and in your heart. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. It needs to be in both places. But if you would attend unto his word, if you would incline your ear unto his saying, if you would, keep it, if, if you would not let it depart from your eyes, if you would observe to do it, it will get into your heart as you believe and act on that word. And then as you do, now what you do is you guard your heart with all diligence. And you don't allow garbage in. You don't allow resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness. You don't allow offense. When those things come, they will come. Jesus says offense will come. But what should you do when it comes? Receive it? No. What should you do when the opportunities to, to, to be unforgiving come? And when resentment comes? You don't have to accept it. Amen? So you guard your heart with all diligence because out of it, your life, out of it flows the streams of life. So you get that word in your heart. And then further, it goes on to say, and put away from you a forward mouth. And a perverse tongue put forth from you. What does that mean? You get the word, faith must be in your heart, but faith must be in your mouth. Don't say things contrary to what you are believing. Let your word, your mouth be filled with faith, not perverse things, not, for, not a forward mouth. Make sure that you keep talking faith. That you keep saying what the word of God says. You know one of the greatest challenges I've noticed, even in believing God where my foot is concerned? is how to keep talking to the mountain and not talk about the mountain. Because, you know, folks, I, I, you know, I mean, people mean well, okay? And they want to ask you, how are you doing? And they want to ask you, what happened? And here, what, here when you got to say, what happened? What, what am I going to do? I got to rehearse what happened. And tell them all about the mountain. And Jesus didn't tell me that. that Jesus didn't say, Ian, this is how you're going to get your victory. Talk about the mountain. No. He says the way you're going to get your victory is speak to the mountain and command it to be removed. Amen? And I mean, and, and I mean people ask things and what do you, you know, you got you know, you to keep staying in faith. You know, because you're believing for the full manifestation and so on and so forth. And you set your faith a certain way. I'm saying that to say that for you to stay in faith and to talk right is not easy. To keep calling those things that be not as though they are. And the reason it's not easy is because other people, including believers, will try to pull you out of there. Amen? By asking you things, by, by trying to tell you maybe you, you're going too far. And you got to be realistic. I heard one person said, concerning a friend of mine that is battling a particular situation. I heard one person said um, that you got you to, um, you got to, you got to, faith without works is dead. And this person's idea of, of a corresponding action is going to the doctor and doing what the doctor says. And now I understand, I must be not putting on doctors. You know, listen to what the advice that the doctor has and so on and so forth. But that's not what the Bible means by corresponding action. Amen? And they mean it. Right? Now you know that's not, but this is what I'm saying. Watch your mouth. Amen? Now we need to close this. Well, let me close it by saying this. Mark chapter 4, verse 20 says, speaks at the end of the parable of the saw. And it speaks about a having a hundredfold return. Amen? Now, if you study out the issue of the hundredfold return, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. Luke 8, 15 says they bring forth fruit with patience. But this hundredfold, quite frankly, if you study it out, if you study it here, if you study it with, 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 with the story of the, the rich young ruler, when Jesus said there is none that has forsaken everything for me in the gospel, which will not receive a hundredfold in this life and so on. If you study the hundredfold, the hundredfold ultimately is directly to connected to the degree to which you abandon yourself to the Lord. And to abandon yourself to the Lord is to abandon yourself to the word. In other words, then, if you will wholeheartedly attend unto his word, incline your ear unto his saying, um, don't let it depart from your eyes, get it in the midst of your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, and put away from you a forward mouth, 
and a perverse tongue put far from you. If you do that, the word will be health to all your flesh. You will have a hundredfold return of healing, of health, divine health, prosperity, and the life that God has for you. Amen? And in any particular area, if you just get that particular word that applies to your situation that you need to see fulfilled, that word has the ability within itself to bring itself to pass. You just take that word and apply this prescription from Proverbs chapter 4 where that word is concerned. And you will bear fruit with patience. It might take some time, but it shall come to pass. God will watch over his word to perform it. And there is no situation that is impossible with God. Therefore, there is no situation that is impossible with the word because God and his word are one. The Bible says that if you live this way, you're going to become like the man who's, who, uh, you become like the Psalms, the Psalms one man. Like a tree planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth fruit in a season. Your leaves will not wither and whatever, and whatever you do will prosper. You're going to become like the Psalms 112 man that delights greatly in the commandments of the Lord and he fears God. What happens? His house is filled with riches. He lends and doesn't borrow. Amen? He is not moved by evil tidings because when bad news comes, why should he be moved? He could change it if he doesn't like it. Amen? Are you with me? This is what God, God has a supernatural life that he wants you and I to live. And it's not what you see out there. It's not an ordinary life. It's a supernatural, extraordinary. It is a life that Jesus has paid for you and I to have. And it can come to pass through the word and how we appropriate the word of God in our lives. I personally believe that to me, outside of salvation, once you get saved, this message is the most important message that I believe anyone could ever preach to believers. How to have victory. How to be everything that God wants, has intended and desired for you to be. Letting the word of God become abandoned to the word of God. Letting that be your ministry. Peter and, James, Peter and John says, we will give ourselves to the ministry of the word. Amen? Which means what? Oh, we're going to be in the word day and night and we're going uh, to so we can be good preachers? Sure, it may mean some of that. But I believe he says, we will give ourselves and let the word have its perfect ministry to us. If the word of God was able to do, can you imagine if the word had freedom and say, okay, you just relax. Let me minister to you. Let me produce what I want to in your life. Can you imagine if the word can have its perfect way in you and accomplish if the word, think of the word as a living thing, sharper than any two-edged sword, having life, having eyes, having ears, nothing naked before it, everything defenseless before it. Imagine that word talking to you, I mean right there before you, and that word is saying, you know what, I have been sent from heaven, and I have a ministry to perform in your life. Would you cooperate with me and allow me to produce and accomplish my ministry in your life fully? What would that word be able to accomplish? What would that word not be able to accomplish? And all it says is you cooperate with me. You do what I tell you to do. Man, that's total victory. Hallelujah.